Good morning. Welcome to Elizabeth Sharon Ann Bible Study. My name is Debbie, and what a wonderful day this is going to be. I want to start out this morning with my a little bit of my devotion, because, you know, I think right now, um, April 18th, this happens to be tax day, and so it's just, it's just great that tax day fell on today's reading but some people may have just a little anxiety or or uh stress about it do you have your taxes done i know i've got to go pick up some taxes today not my personal but for for uh i'm secretary of a uh non so i've i've got to go get that it's not done yet so that that's on my mind but you know what What's in your control? Whenever, whenever you think about the day, do you let the things that stress you get out of control? Good morning, Nancy. So today, as you are, are you as you're going about your day, keep your focus on Him. Make your goal to take captive everything and make it obedient to Jesus. Your mind's going to wonder because you're going to wonder when are you going to get that call that your taxes are done? Or when will I get that other call? Or, or whatever is in your thoughts. Get, cap, get those captive and bring them into his presence. You'll have peace. Peace that surpasses understanding whenever you get that relationship going with him. I, I, I thought that was perfect for today. Okay, so again, welcome to Elizabeth Sharon Ann Bible Study. We do this every morning at 830 and put your prayer request in. Do uh, your praise reports because I know that there's praise reports as well as, as what your needs are. Um, we serve a God that is a God of miracles, and it is awesome to see what he's doing throughout our, our friend group that's on our Facebook Bible study. And so like this page as well as go to Facebook and, and find Elizabeth Sharon Ann there and like, like the page and subscribe too. I think I've checked off everything on the, my list of things to talk about. And so, you know, we, we just celebrated Easter yesterday. We've, it was building up for this last week. And good morning, Lori. Lori brought us our message yesterday. And so, you know, I, I like to put myself back in that place. What do you think it was like the day after the resurrection if you were there? If you were there, what, what, would, what was the day like? Every, do you think that, you know, since you, you didn't go to the tomb to see it was empty and the stone rolled away, were you at home fixing breakfast this morning and, and just, just thinking, hmm, what just happened? What just happened? And then did you go outside and you hear people start talking about he's alive? And then you again wonder what just happened. And, and then it just goes on and on. Your, your curiosity is, is, is peak and, and you're, you're wanting to know more. Why are people talking about him? Might he die? And then you, that's what we're wanting to do today is get our curiosity aroused so we can, we can keep digging into his word because we, we read all, everything about it in here. He's alive and he's with us today. So as we get started today, we're in Joshua 16 through 28, that we will be reading of more about the allotment of the descendants of Joseph. And, you know, this can get a little, little, maybe you want to say boring because there's a lot of, there's a lot of names in here that we don't even mentioned today whenever you talk about the the uh well, let me find some Canaanites out of Gezer um all, all of these different things that we don't normally 
have in our normal conversation. So like, you know, you could probably easily skip over some of this stuff just because it's, it's, uh, it's just different. But you know, if you dig down into it, you're gonna find, you're gonna find some interesting nuggets in here. And so as it goes on to talk about in like uh, verse four, this was a homeland allocated to the families of Joseph's son, Manasseh and Ephraim. And then it got, breaks down what, what was given to Ephraim. Got to get my Bible out of the sun. And then verse nine, in addition, some towns with their surrounding villages in the territory allocated to the half tribe of Manasseh were set aside for the tribe of Ephraim. They did not drive the Canaanites out of Gezer. However, so the people of Gezer live as slaves among the people of Ephraim to this day. Now we'll read about this failure to drive out the Canaanites in Judges. But this is what happens, like we've talked about the yeast how it just spreads. It can be just a little bit of yeast and it spreads through everything and, and affects everything. They didn't drive everybody out for whether it was greed or need or whatever. They didn't do it. And this will become an issue. <clears throat> And then verse seven or chapter 17, it goes on to talk about uh, the next allotment that for the half tribe of Manasseh. And on down to verse three, it talks about Zelophehad, a descendant of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Maker, son of Manasseh, had no sons, only daughters, whose names were. Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tursa. And so these women came to El Eliezer, the priest, Joshua's son of Nun, and said, the Lord commanded Moses to give us a grant of land along with the men of our tribe. And so Joseph gave them the grant of land. And th it, was, it was awesome because this was a promise back that God had gave to Moses. It says the Lord commanded Moses to give us a grant of land among with the men of our tribe. And, and so God's promises are, are carved in stone, aren't they? <clears throat> I thought that was, that was really good. Um, and then let's go on to let me look and see what I, where I want to get to now. <clears throat> um, again, there's a lot. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to read all these names. I read it. Don't get me wrong. I read it, but I don't know anything about this. You know, it would be different if they were talking about towns in Oklahoma that that they were giving they were giving my family land. And so, if they talked about you know that it went from Norman to Purcell to to Wayne, to Lindsay, and back up to Blanchard. I know I I would know exactly what they were talking about. I don't. I'm not familiar with this. And so, on down to verse twelve, uh, it says, "But the descendants of Manasseh were unable to occupy these towns because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that region." One more time, we have the same disobedience as the failure of the tribe of Ephraim. When we don't clean out our, our, our house, things start, I mean, just think, it just starts growing again. Later, when the Israelites became strong enough, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they still didn't drive them out. They're still there. They're still worshiping their idols. They're still introducing their customs into their children. The descendants of Joseph came to Joshua and asked, why have you given us only one portion of land as our homeland when our people has blessed us with so many people? Joshua replied, if there are so many of you and if the hill country of Ephraim is not large enough 
clear out the land for yourselves in the forest where the parasites and the referites live. Go do it yourself. Don't just sit back and, and wait for somebody to go clear the land, dig the wells, put up your tents, bring your cattle over there, get up and go. And then in 17, then Joshua said to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the descendants of Joseph, since you're so large and strong, you will be given more than one portion. The forest of the hill country will be yours as well. Clear as much land as you want. Clear it all. And take possession of it to the farthest corners. See, sometimes we don't want to work that hard. We, we want... We want to take the easy route. And, and easy, if, if everything was easy, everybody would do it. But nobody wanted to clear this land. Well, so here you go, guys. If you want that, just go for it. It's an awesome response from, from Joshua. So then chapter 18. Now that the land was under Israelite control, the entire community of Israel gathered at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle. But there remained seven tribes who had not yet been allotted their grants of land. So why would they not want to possess their land? Why would Joshua have to prod them? He says, how long are you going to wait before taking possession of the remaining land the Lord of God gave your ancestors has given to you and then he's got to tell them what to do map it or you know select free men he's mapping it out for them he's got to give practical leadership to these people i think maybe sometimes we just get used to following the lead of somebody and we don't we don't take the initiative ourselves to to move forward it sometimes the unknown is scary to some people they get used to those times of bondage and slavery and think this is this is the way it will always be and they don't know what it would be like to to be free of what has held them back in the past. <clears throat> and as you go on, you'll continue reading about the final division of the land, in the tribe of Benjamin. And there's there's little nuggets in there. And it's you know what? It's 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 a good exercise to read things that's difficult. You know, it's kind of like they didn't want to go clear the land. Well, sometimes we don't want to read the hard things. And, you know, this is, this is just mapping it out. Do we, you know, why should we read that? Well, because it's in the Bible. I've read it. I'm thinking if I read it, you need to write, read it too. So next, let's go into Luke 19, 1 through 27. Zacchaeus. Did I mention this is tax day? Isn't that awesome? We're reading about Zacchaeus on tax day. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. And there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich. You know what? In, he probably had to apply for this job. He got in there and he found, oh, wow, I can, I can make a lot of money. I'm going to hire people to collect it for me. I will, this, is, this is my little addition to the story. You know, I'm, <laughs> to make it just a little, it's already juicy. I don't, I don't really need to add to it. It says he tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. See, there's obstacles that sometimes we have whenever we're trying to, to see him, talk to him, spend time with him. But he figured out he could climb a tree. So see, there was a way 
for him to be able to see Jesus. He found a sycamore. It's, this says a sycamore fig tree beside the road. For Jesus was going to pass that way. I can't hardly read this story without the little uh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man song that we we sang whenever we were little little ones in in Sunday school. I'm going to have to teach my grandson that. So he ran ahead. He ran ahead and climbed in this tree. I saw a picture of one, and it had it was like just full canopy of leaves you could climb up in the tree and nobody could see you so maybe did he want to be hidden as he climbed in that tree maybe there was other trees maybe there was a rock he could have stood on that he could have seen Jesus as he walked by and been and you know been right out there in front I mean he's used to being in front of people <clears throat> because he made decisions he collected money he chose the tree. When Jesus came by, he looked at Zacchaeus and called him by name. See, I know you. I'm claiming you. Do you recall God calling people by name? Didn't he call out Gideon, Samuel? Did he, did, did they, he call out other ones? He called Zacchaeus by name. He's saying, quick. Come down, don't waste any time. Come now. Come. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus, come down from your high place. Come down, quit hiding. Quit hiding. I know your name. I know who you are. I know what you've done. See, Zacchaeus, I know all about you. Get out of the tree. Come down. Get off of that place that you've been so Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house with great excitement and joy don't you know he he was he was just all over the place he didn't know what to think this this Jesus is coming to my house did he also think that, oh, I've got people's tax money all around that I've been embezzling and taking away from him. And I don't know. Oh, oh, I hope somebody's cleaned up the mess. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was neat as a pen. And maybe he was, maybe Jesus took Matthew with him. What if Jesus took Matthew with him to see Zacchaeus? But the people were displeased. He has gone to be a guest of a notorious sinner that grumbled. See, because they didn't like him. Isn't that awesome that Jesus would go to the house of somebody that nobody likes? They've been talking about how, how awful Zacchaeus is. Jesus went there. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Which is remarkable for that time. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man, which Jesus called himself, came to seek and save those who are lost. So, you suppose, do you suppose that Zacchaeus talked to some of the disciples too and found that he was going to, to follow Jesus, that means you, you sold everything, you gave everything away, you gave it all, and you followed him. It seems that Zacchaeus had a complete change. See, John 10, 3 says that he calls his sheep by name. He said Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, the name Zacchaeus means pure one. So when his mama named him, she knew, or maybe the, the spirit told her what he was going to be. He had to go through some things by choice, 
on on what his life was going to be like. But in the end, the pure one invited Jesus in. And I don't know about you, but that gives me hope for for family, for friends that's struggling in some way because Jesus knows their name. He will work it out. Pray for your kids, pray for your grandchildren and just know that Jesus will come to their house. The crowd was listening to everything Jesus said and because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. And so this is the parable of the stewards. This, is, this parallels with the parable of the talents that we read about in Matthew 25, but it's still different. <clears throat> so he talks about a nobleman, nobleman that was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then returned. Before he left, he called 10 of his servants and divided among them 10 pounds of silver. Invest in this while I am gone. While I am gone, but do you notice he doesn't say, I'll be back next Friday, or I will be back in two months or next year. He just says, invest while I'm gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we do not want him to be our king. After he was crowned king, he returned and called the servants from whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first one said, I invested your money and made 10 times the original amount. The next, and he said, well done. The next one, I invested your money and made five times. And he said, well done. You'll be, you'll govern over five cities. The third one said, he brought back the original amount that he had. And he said, I hid it. I was afraid. You were, you're a hard man. And I didn't want to lose it. Basically, I didn't want to lose it. And then he calls him a wicked servant. Why didn't you deposit it? See, this was, as I read that, I thought, oh, this is like a job evaluation. Did you ever have an evaluation for your job? You know, I did every year. There would be, I, I would have to submit my goals and my accomplishments and where I stood year to date. And then we would work together to find what I could do to improve on my shortcomings. And I thought this, this was like the original, the original job evaluation. And with that, there are rewards. And in this case, punishment. In some cases, non-reward which feels like a punishment if you don't get a pay increase. But this was, let's see, let me get on down here. He said, so then turning to the other standing nearby, the king ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. He took away what they, what they had and gave it to the other ones. See, if you don't use what God's given you, you hear use it or lose it use that for the glory of God and watch him expand and increase and and raise up the level of your talents of your of of whatever gifting it is that he's given to you and I don't think it always has to be on the financial side of it it could be that that you're using your the physical talents he gave you Maybe you sing beautiful and you'll sing better. Maybe you're an artist in, in whatever capacity that is. And that will, that will be refined and, and even better than it was. But he, the, yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, those who do nothing, just think about the, the land that that the people didn't want want to clear or maybe they did want to clear but said if you just go do it you've got you've got 
men that are totally capable of clearing land, do it. Sometimes just do it. Don't do nothing. Do what you can and let God multiply it. As for these enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. The servants of the master each had to answer to him. They probably knew that there would be a punishment if they didn't do it. But you know what? They didn't know when it was going to happen. So they, they were pro procrastinators. Just like there's probably some procrastinators procrastinators today I, man I shouldn't even pick that word you know do you have your are you still gathering up receipts for your taxes you knew this day was coming and and you you're still gathering it together you're still trying to make an appointment you're still you're thinking okay well it's all right I'm going to do an extension just go ahead see if these people if these people would have went ahead and and just acted like he was coming back today, they would have done everything necessary to prepare for it, but they didn't. So Zacchaeus, I found a, a Billy Graham classic of Zacchaeus, his sermon on that. And it was so awesome to listen to that this morning. And if you get a chance, go, go look that up. Billy Graham classics on Zacchaeus. Psalms 87. Let me see how much time I've got. Oh, I've got Elizabeth. I'm doing good today. On the holy mountain stands a city founded by the Lord. Zion, the holy mountain, Jerusalem, and its temple represent the future community of all believers. He loves the city of Jerusalem more than any other city in Israel. See, God loves us. Oh, city of God, what glorious things are said of you. I will count Egypt and Baal. Babylon among those who know me, also Philistia and Tyre, even distant Ethiopia. And see, you see the little asterisk by Egypt? That Rahab is a poetic name for Egypt. They have all become citizens of Jerusalem. Then look at six. When the Lord registers the nation, he will say, they have all become citizens of Jerusalem. The people will play flutes and sing the source of my life springs from Jerusalem. Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth from get rich quick schemes quickly disappear. Wealth from hard work grows over time. Now I mentioned today is tax day and we're reading about money, get rich, quick schemes this is this is talking about people that are that are cheating trying to figure out a loophole a way to not have to pay the taxes that they're owing you know that's one of those that's a that's a sin that that you know what it, it doesn't show it doesn't you know I don't have a hat that says I'm a tax cheater I don't have any it, you know you, I can I can cheat on my taxes and then I go out and visit with people and you don't even see anything about me that looks like that wow you know so you know it's just like Zacchaeus Jesus called him out of the tree he was hiding he got that pie so he could see so get out of that tree and come down today and just know that he loves you. He knows your name. He knows what, what your life is like. And let him help you navigate through these, these trials that you're going through, these days that, that is coming. Jesus is there and he loves you. And this is a wonderful day after Easter. Enjoy that and just meditate on that and think about how our, our father put his son on the cross for you, for me. He loves us that much. 
And I think that is absolutely amazing. You have a great day and come back tomorrow. Elizabeth will be here tomorrow and sharing the word with you then. Bye-bye. We'll see you then.